your hands together.
Jesus saved my life. I was bound, now I'm free. Walking in the light, that's the reason why. That's the reason I clap my hands, move my feet, get a dignity.
this Resurrection Sunday as we are celebrating the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen, somebody. What a beautiful crowd. Covenant life, as we can see, we have guests all over the house today. Could we give our guests a great hand of appreciation? Thank you so much for worshiping with us today here at Covenant Life. In fact, why don't you reach over, shake somebody's hand. I know it's a little difficult to get out of the aisle, but just let somebody know it is great to see them today. If you're joining us online, Thank you so much for watching today. Maybe you're traveling. Maybe you're a member of Covenant Life praying for you today. But if you're watching for the first time, we would love to invite you to be a part of a service very soon with us. What a beautiful crowd we have here today. Once you've said hello to somebody, greeted them, you return to your seat. You can be seated for a moment if you have a seat this morning. My goodness, what a crowd. We did anticipate this. If you're a member here and you can squeeze in and make some room on the edges for those that are brand new with us, we want to accommodate every guest that is here. And again, I read it a few a few months ago, and we've said it since then. The only person that's excited about a very full church is the pastor, is the quote that I read. If you are a member or if you're a guest coming in and you see that there might not be that many seats. That can be a little bit of an intimidating or a scary thing, but we want to pause for a moment and just once again say thank you to every guest. We realize it is full today, but you have made our day by being here. And listen, you are not an inconvenience to us. You are the reason we do what we do. And this Resurrection Sunday is not only going to be full with a, a great worship and amazing preaching today, but I want to give you just a few announcements about what you can expect as soon as service concludes today. Uh, we are going to step out of these doors, and as you know, if you've been a member here, if you've visited before, easily we can bottleneck right there in that four-year area. But today, on this beautiful day, how many is thankful for this great weather that we have on Resurrection Sunday? Thank you, Jesus, for that. Uh, with that being said, our kids and our families are about to have amazing festivities as soon as this is over. Uh, they're in the back right now. If you have children, they've not yet gone back to their worship experience. I would encourage you to allow them to do so. We have some of the most amazing workers when it comes to uh, volunteering to take care of our kids. Just great caretakers. They're already worshiping. In fact, there's a good chance. I know this is hard to believe, but there's a good chance they might even be louder than we are here in just a little bit. So your kids are having a blast and as soon as service is over uh, we will step outside of those front glass doors your children will actually be waiting on you right there with our kids team uh, and then they will connect with you and there's going to be a candy rain which sounds like amazing. It's the only kind of rain that I wanted to happen today on Easter, which was rain and candy. Can I get an amen? And all the single ladies, maybe rain and men. I'm just kidding. I'm so sorry. It's Easter Sunday. Straighten up, for goodness sakes. All right, here we go. But that candy rain is going to be an amazing time. And then on top of it, adjacent to that, there is an ice cream truck. I don't know if I should call it a truck, but there's going to be free ice cream. So we wanted to make sure uh, we've actually made a deal with the local dentists here in the county to give you all the candy and ice cream that we can today. And so your kids are going to go home full of sugar and excitement, and hopefully you'll go home full of the Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen from somebody? It's going to be a great day. God's got amazing things for us, and I do want to tell you, if you are new to Covenant Life, just a couple of quick things. Normally, on any given Sunday, we would have a meet and greet for our guests, but obviously today, uh, with all of the guests in the house, we cannot accommodate that. But please, come back come back and visit us again. Uh, as a pastoral staff, it would be an honor to get to meet you, to get to know you, because here at Covenant Life, we have uh, some really amazing ways of onboarding brand new people. Look at your neighbor and say, Life Groups. Listen, Covenant Life is more than just a Sunday church. We are connected to other disciples in this community that we call Covenant Life. And so we would love for you to get plugged in. Our life groups meet not just here at church, but all across our community. And so be a part of that. We would love to see you get connected and be a part of what God is doing right here at Covenant Life. He has amazing things for you. We believe that God has an amazing plan for your life. Can I get an amen from somebody in this room. And here's what we also know. 
We also know that if you walked into this room today and you're human, which I can, from what I can tell, most of us are today, that you've walked in with needs, you've got things that you're facing, you've got issues that you might be, that you might have come up against this week. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, is more than just something on the calendar that we celebrate and just ceremonially go through. No, we believe that the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, is more than just a story, but it is a reality that we live in. And today, if you walked in and you may be facing something that feels very broken, feels like it's dead and gone and over with, I've come to declare to you today that God is still raising dead things to life again. Maybe you need a healing in your body. I believe God can heal you. Maybe you need God to reach deep into your soul. God can mend the broken heart. Today, there is a risen Savior who is bringing life to things that feel broken. So if you would, would you stand with me one more time? We're about to go back into worship. Our ushers are going to serve today as we give in tithing and offering. But what we're going to do is we're going to pray together. And if you walked in, and you have something in your life that you're facing, today we're going to pray over that need, and we know that God is able. In fact, as a sign of faith, would you, if you walked in with a need today, just make it known by the lifted hand in this room right now. Needs are represented. We're about to go back into worship, but right now in this moment, could you connect with somebody around you if it's appropriate? Could we begin to pray together? God, we speak in the name of Jesus over every need, over every situation. No matter what it might be, God, you are able to perform. You're a healer. You're a way maker. You are the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, today is more than just a tradition. It's not a ceremony. No, God, today we celebrate and believe that you are alive and well. So we pray let healing be in this room. We declare in the name of Jesus that dead things come to life. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would restore families, God. That you would put things back together, God. That in the name of Jesus you would lift up the broken one. And before they leave this room, God, something great would take place. God, we speak it for the remainder of this service. We pray, bless this offering, bless our worship, and bless Pastor as he delivers the word today. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen and amen. Our ushers will serve each row. Let's worship together.
together today, today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is because of who He is today. It's not because of a church sign out, out in the property. It's not because of a preacher's name today. It's not because of a family connection that we gather. We gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He told them when He was with them, when you gather in my name, when you gather together in my name, I will be in the midst of you. And he said that before his death, but he signified that he would be with us in spirit. And the Bible says that it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's none other than the Spirit of Jesus. Because the Bible says the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And there's freedom today in the Spirit of God that is moving in this room is the same breath of Jesus Christ when he breathed on his own disciples and said receive ye the Holy Ghost and so he's breathing on us today I welcome all of you I know this is a, a full house uh, folks are moving our, our members are getting up and giving places and thank you uh, Covenant Life members for accommodating our guests today this is uh, what it's all about reaching up and reaching out and we are so thankful we recognize uh, the, the possible little bit of discomfort uh, of what uh, the setting is here uh, I'll say this just a quick note if you know any properties you know any buildings we are in the market now I've got folks lined up I've got the phone ringing uh, I promise you two, two this week uh, that they want to buy our building so folks are lined up to buy this building but uh, but but nobody's lining up to sell us a building, so uh, we'd like that. We'd like that, but we're gonna we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. It's gonna be a great time together. I'm not gonna take a long time this morning. Uh, it's all a celebration about Jesus Christ, and I'm so very thankful to be a part of it. I, if you don't know, I'm I'm Pastor David Akers of this church, but uh, I'm a part of the one of one of the most wonderful families of God. This covenant life community and what God is doing in His church and His people. Uh, we want to welcome you back again uh, next week and the next week and the next week. We'd love to see you again and again. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Each of the Gospels have a, uh, a witness of His resurrection. And this is uh, the Apostle John who was privy to it. He was on the scene. He writes of his own experience here. And he says in verse number 1, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple. That happens to be the one writing it. He's speaking of himself. He always does it in the third person. The other disciple whom Jesus loved, again himself speaking, he said to them, or she said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple John and were going to the tomb so they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first John gets there first and he John stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying there yet John did not go in then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, just past John right up. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief <coughs> that, was, that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself, as if there had been attention given to it. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb, John, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw... And believed. He saw and believed. For as yet they, his followers, did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So it's all coming together. 
Then the disciples went away again to their homes and they began to broadcast this, herald this to others. I want to take a few minutes tonight, or rather this morning, taking another look into the tomb. Taking another look one more time into that tomb. Father, I thank you today for every heart. There is so many places that, Lord, folks could have gone today. So many churches and other places. But they are here and we are thankful for our guest. We are thankful, Lord, for the membership of your body. But most of all, we are thankful that you were here. That you were in the midst of your people. That you were with us today. We are celebrating a resurrection. We are celebrating life abundant. And I ask God that you would give me the words. Give us the ears to hear. And I pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let the church say amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. There is no more important of a question in all of the world and in all of history and in all of eternity than what was in or not in that tomb on that morning. It matters. It matters beyond any other thing you can contemplate if that tomb was truly empty. If that tomb was empty, then life as we know it, the world as we know it, the universe as we know it, history and eternity has all been changed if it is empty. If that tomb was empty, something from outside of nature, something from outside of of creation was working that morning. It matters. Some would say, I would be a Christian even if the tomb wasn't empty. And you would be as what Paul would write later, you would be of all men most miserable. Because our hope today is not just in the moral teachings of Jesus Christ. And he was a great teacher. Many follow him even beyond the the boundaries of Christianity, even into the world. His his teachings are appreciated. His moral compass, his, his leadership, his parables, his words are quoted by by all kinds, but it matters what happened that morning in that tomb. Let us this morning therefore go to that tomb and one more time let us look again inside of that tomb because I will tell you today, my I'm just going to get ahead of myself because I know that tomb is empty. This house is full today. If that tomb was not empty, there would not be a full house today of us walking into this room with our hands lifted and singing because he lives. I can face tomorrow. How many is thankful today that you can face tomorrow because he lives forevermore? You know, we, we, uh, we like to think of these early disciples as heroic and Almost we, we put a, a mythical side to them, but they were very normal people. They were very average people, and that ought to make all of us feel somewhat good today because their responses and their interactions around this tomb uh, are very natural responses. Mary came running, and she found Peter and John, and these words, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. She said, I I went to the tomb this morning. They were going to honor him. They were not going to see if he was alive. They were not going to see if, if he was resurrected. That was not on their minds. They were going to that tomb that morning because they wanted to honor his body. They wanted to honor who he was and his life he had lived. He had been taken off of that cross in a very swift fashion. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But they wanted to 
pay their respects with perfumes and ointments. They, were, they didn't even know who was going to roll back the stone. They were talking among themselves. We're going to go and, and I don't know how the, t- the, the tomb, the stone in front of it is, weighs a lot. How are we going to get it pushed uh, to the side that we can get in to honor him and uh, to honor his, his uh, deceased body? But they went and they found that the stone had been rolled away. And then they were worried of why it was rolled away. We're going to worry whether the stone's in front or the stone's rolled away. We're going to find a reason to be worried. But they were very natural in their response. She running back found Peter and John and said in her despair, they've taken him away. She didn't believe in a resurrection at that moment. She just believed somebody has played a cruel joke on all of us. They've stolen his body. Was it not enough that they had crucified him? Was it not enough that they had lied about him? Now they are desecrating his grave. They are dishonoring honoring his memory and and it was this we find all of their responses uh, are a doubtful matter of fact even after the Lord had shown that he was alive Matthew states they worshipped him but some doubted that was even after the resurrection and proof that he was alive there were still some people that were looking at his resurrected body and they were trying to figure out Could this be real? Are we seeing what our eyes are beholding? So it is here that we find that this is a, I would call it normal response of of a human being of looking and trying to figure it out. Peter and John themselves, they go to the tomb and they find that this this sight that Mary is speaking of is true. You know, uh, there is a place, a couple of places in Jerusalem that are considered by uh, Christians and by those of the traditional faiths that it could be possibly they found the tomb of Jesus. And one of the one of the proofs of it is, is an empty tomb, of course. But um, we we look at that. I visited that a few years ago in uh, 2019. And when we went in, one of the things that they kept telling us as we were going to go into the tomb, it was a little tourist site there, is that be careful. Be careful when you go into the tomb. Be careful. And they kept saying, you're going to bump your head. Don't bump your head. And so I've got pictures. I looked it up yesterday to see if I bumped my head because I couldn't remember. Either they were telling us or I did. Maybe both. But I do remember the bumping your head story in my mind. Be careful because the wall is about that thick. But when you go in, you kind of think you're all the way through. But you're not because it's a pretty thick uh, wall. And, and so it's, it's actually a hewn out area on the side of a cliff. And so when you go in, you lift up too soon and you're going to bump your head. And so they kept telling us, why am I saying that? Because I still feel like that around this tomb, people are bumping their head. They're bumping their head trying to figure out, is it really true? They're bumping their head to figure out, you know, theologians are bumping their head. Religious people are bumping their head and they're trying to figure out. So we're going to talk about this tomb today. John said it this way in verse 4, so they both ran together, Peter and John, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. So the first thing is John said, I outran Peter. I love that. I outran him. He makes a note of that in the Bible. I want you to know, I in a foot race, I can take, I can take Simon Peter. I'm, I'm sure. Well, we know by by most of history and tradition that Peter was probably the older one of the group. He was probably in his 20s or uh, late 20s. John was probably the youngest of all them. So the teenager outran the married guy. Big deal. Okay. So he gets to the tomb, John does, but something happens at that door. John stops at that door and doesn't go in. He says that he 
stoops down. Again, he's speaking in the third person. He says, and the one stooped down and looking in. He there at that moment hesitated. Some have wondered why he hesitated to go in. The Arabic version of this is he dared not go in. Something stopped him at the door. Stooping down, bending to the side is what that means in the Greek. He bent over because it is a lower area. Now where I went in, they've dug it out and it's, it's easy to get to. But in that we understand wherever this was you had to bend down to get in. I'm going to say that again. You had to bend down to get in. And some reason, John maybe out of respect maybe out of honor some have even said maybe even because he was a little, you know creeped out. You know, I, I'm not going in there. And there were a lot of Jewish traditions and laws to be careful around the dead. So John was hesitant to go in. The word bend down or stooping is a word used by Peter later in his letter. He says in 1 and 12, they were told that their messages were not for themselves, this is the prophets, but for you. And he goes on to say, now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Now Peter's talking about Old Testament prophets here. And he said they weren't even talking about themselves. They were talking about us and the ones that would receive these promises. Then he finishes it. He says, it is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. The King James says, angels even desire to look into. So there's your Greek word. So John is looking into intently, but not going in. Angels are looking into, stooping over from heaven, watching all of this unfold and trying to understand all of God's grace, all of God's mercy. You and I have today what angels are intrigued by. You and I are experiencing even what angels today are looking and saying, I wish I could figure all of this out. How many is glad you have what angels desire to look into today? So John is, is hesitant to go in. He stops at the door and he looks in. That is the first take, the first view is to stop at the door And to look in. How many have done that to the Lord, to his church, to to his glory, to his truth? They've stopped and not gone in. But they are intrigued. They are looking intently. But they're not sure they want to go in. Oh, today, if you've hesitated at the door of life, I want you to know he's inviting us in to his love. And he's inviting us in to his grace and mercy. Now I'm going to give you something to think about here. When he was stooping down to get to Christ, you have to bend down. And that is sometimes a problem for people. They don't want to stoop. They don't want to bend. But I'm going to tell you, the Bible says every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. So you can bend today in his presence or there'll be in the future a time for every knee to bow in judgment. I read this a few years ago and took it yesterday for, for this service. I have read of a great cathedral where there is a statue of Christ. As one enters the cathedral and stands before the statue, he is appalled at the ugliness and repulsiveness of the sculptor's representation of Christ. He wonders whether that is what Christ really looked like. He is keenly disappointed. But then, as he comes closer to the statue, he can see an inscription on it which reads, Kneel down and look up. He kneels down and looks up. And lo, everything about it is different. The repulsive is replaced by a wonderful attractiveness. The face of Christ is not ugly anymore. What makes the difference? It's the position of the observer. If he stands up and looks at the statue, there is no beauty to it. 
But if he kneels down and looks up, he simply falls in love with that person. Today, if you're eye level, it doesn't look right. Something's not attractive about it. This thing is only beautiful in worship. This thing is only beautiful when you face him on your knees and look up. And when you do so, you lose your dignity, you lose your pride, you lose your ego. But you look up and you see the beauty of Jesus Christ. You see the love of Jesus Christ. You see the forgiveness. How many is glad one day you knelt before him and you heard him say, go and sin no more. Thy sins are forgiven. Somebody clap your hands and give God a shout. The word here is a, is a word that he, it says looking down or bending down looking in is one Greek word. It's the word blepo. The word blepo is a word that means to be observant, searching out, or to see with the mind's eye. John is looking. He's trying to perceive. It is also used in Jesus' parables. Hear me now. Because there's a way to see but not see. And this is exactly where John was at this point. He was seeing but not seeing. Jesus says in Mark 4 and 11, so that they will continually look. That's blepo. That's Greek. The same word John was doing. I, he was seeing. They shall continually look but not see. Hang on to that next word there, see, because I'm going to get to it in a minute. And they will continually hear but not understand. Otherwise, they might turn from their rejection of the truth and be forgiven. What there is here is there's a seeing without seeing. And there's a hearing without hearing. There's an observing but not grasping. There is this ability to stand at the door of this of this Christ, of this church, of this message, but not go in trying to figure it out. You've got to do more. You've got to be willing to bend. You've got to be willing to bow. You've got to be willing to worship. Now let's move on. Simon, he comes up. John's outrun him. John's looking over, and Peter just runs up. Excuse me. And he just goes on in just like him. Man, if you know anything about this fellow's life, he's the one that gets out of the boat and walks on water and then sinks. And he's the one that, ooh, 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 I, I know the answer. He's always getting himself into trouble. He is just this, this sort of guy. He just goes right on in. He, he wants to know what's going on. And when he gets in, the Bible says Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in the place by itself. Now he begins to look. He begins to, to look around. And, and he's seeing what John can't see because his eyes are now adjusting to the darkness. And he's starting to view this thing. Are you, are, are you listening today? Are you seeing what's going on? He seeth, the Bible says. He, he see, he saw the linen clothes. This is a different word. This word comes from the Greek that means theorio. Theorio, almost like the cookie. Theorio. Now that's my rendition of the Greek. If we've got a Greek scholar, correct me later, not now. Theorio. What is it? It's the ability to see. We have a word for it. We usually, we have a word. Theorio. It's where we get theory. He began to theorize. He began to look around and have a theory. Hmm. He investigated. He stepped a little further into it and said, Now I'm going to study this out. I'm going to look at this. I'm not going to stand at the door and just look in. I'm going to, I'm going to study the Word. I'm going to study the Bible. I'm going to study this thing. And he begins to have his own theories. The word means to gaze contemplatively, which suggests deeper thinking or making a careful observation. To a spectator, it is like being a spectator, to watch from the sidelines trying to figure it all out. So here he is. Okay, okay, what's going on? What's going on? 
and he begins to think about, theorize. And what he sees is he sees the linen. This is mentioned. The linen is, is there. Now, it could be that the linen is just flat laying there, but others are saying, no, no, no. That linen was not flat. On the, the, I mean the wrappings of the body of Jesus. It was not flat on that slab there, but something different happened. Let me read out of one, uh, one, contem, uh, one commentator. Like a giant bandage, these wrappings were wound around the body of our Lord. Beginning at the feet and ending up at the head, John saw these linen clothes lying, and Peter as well, undisturbed, just as they had been when the body of Jesus lay within them. But now, there was no body. The linen clothes were empty. Now, here's what I want you to see. John 19 tells us that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea bought a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe spices and wound the body of Jesus in the clothes on the cloth wrappings with spices. As they wrapped the clothes strip, the cloth strip around and around Jesus' body, they poured in a hundred pounds of spices into the wrappings upon his body. All these liquid spices would soon harden and would cause the cloth wrappings to become an encrusted cocoon around the body of Jesus. All the wrappings followed the contours of the body. It would be a tight, solid covering that would protect the body and from which the body could not be pulled by any human means. So the only way you could have gotten Jesus out if you're stealing his body in a natural, like grave robber way is you would have to have cut all of those wrappings and it would have been a very difficult thing, especially in the dark, because it was in the middle of the night that all this was, or rather early in the morning before the rise of the sun. All you, so they're looking at this and saying, I, I, there's no way somebody has stolen his body. But this is what I want you to see. The word here denotes that Peter did not see a flat folded square like a tablecloth, but a ball of cloth bearing the appearance of being round, rolled around an object that was no longer there. In other words, the shape of the body was still apparent in them, but the flesh and bone had disappeared. So they're seeing the whole. They're seeing what was, and it does not collapse on itself. Now, folks, I want to tell you, that's even talking about it, it's like, ooh, that's a little spooky right there. But it is already dawning on them. He's not here. All we're seeing is grave clothes. All we're seeing is what used to be. Can I just stop right now and tell you when you find the power of God in your life and you become a follower of Jesus Christ, the world will look at you and say, you know, you still look like the same old person. You still, your facial features, you're outward, but there's something different about you yeah all you're seeing on the outward is a shell of what I used to be but something powerful has happened on the inside of my soul all you're seeing right now is grave clothes can I tell you these are grave clothes one day I'm going to put off this body and I'm going to put on a new body oh how many is glad that's the hope of the child of God is mortal shall put on immortality and corrupt shall put on incorrupt. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. So they're seeing this form, this what used to be, but it's empty. And, and Peter is theorizing. Now I wanna, I'm going to move quickly here. But there's folks that theorize all the time about this. I'll, I'll just give you a few. There are people that say he did not rise from the dead. But their theory is, I'm going to give you a couple, the swoon theory. The swoon theory. The theory here is, by skeptics, Jesus never died on that cross. He was on the cross, but they thought he was dead, but he was in a coma. True. That's, that's a theory. They took him off that cross thinking he was dead, put him in those wrappings, took him to the tomb, and somewhere in the middle of the night he came to. 
Yeah, it's that funny. One lady wrote in a question and answer forum. She said, Dear sirs, my friend said that at Easter that Jesus just swooned on the cross and that the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely, bewildered. Dear bewildered, the answer was, Beat your friend with a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes. Nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for six hours. Run a spear through his side. Put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. <laughs> Theories. Because, you know, I don't know why they don't want him to be alive. I want him to be alive. I mean, our hope is that he's alive. Our hope is that he's resurrected. There's, there's the kidnap theory, the kidnap theory, that they just went and they took the body of the disciples, which is really kind of the original lie. The, the Jewish leaders said, we'll pay you to say that the disciples snuck in and got his body. So that's an old one the devil came up with. But I like this one. This is one of my favorites, the wrong tomb. The disciples didn't know where for sure Jesus was buried and laid. So they, they wound up going to the wrong tomb. And you know those two angels that said he's not here, he is risen? They say, the theory says that they went to the wrong tomb and there was just a couple of young guys there that morning. And they said, oh no, he's not here, he's up there on that hill in another tomb. So that got translated, he's not here, he's risen. Wow, you are stretching it there. But thank you for the theory. Thank you for standing there and trying to figure it all out for us who were too foolish to know better. Are you with me? Then there's finally the hallucination theory. That they wanted him so desperately to have not gone through Calvary and to have died. That they saw him and they hallucinated. What's really powerful about that was he was seen by 11 and then eventually he was seen by 500 at one time. Wow, what a party. I don't know what they were smoking. But I don't want it. Are you with me? I'm just telling you right now. There's the idea here that anything but, anything but resurrection, anything but resurrection, I'm going to theor- here he is, Peter's standing there. He's not doubting. He's just trying to figure it all out. He's just trying to figure it all out. And finally, as he's standing there, John, who hesitated, he steps in. And this is what it says. The other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed. Woo! Something different about that one. He saw. The word saw there is a word that means hurao. Hurao is to form a mental perception, to understand, to realize in the mind what has taken place. And what is attached to it is that he saw and that he believed. He saw and he believed. I want you to understand right now that that is the difference in all of the views you can have. You can stand at the door and look in. You can walk in a little further, pick up this Bible and theorize. I don't know if I agree. I don't know. Seems like it's this. You can do all of that or you can see for yourself You can know for yourself. You can remember what the Lord has done and say, wait a minute, something. He said something. Remember what he's, remember a moment ago I told you, don't forget that verse, Mark 4 and 11, so that they will continually look. That is what he did at first, bleepo, but not see. That's the second word, horeo. That is the word that says understand. Jesus said there are some seeing, but they're not grasping. They'll continually 
hear but not understand. But John went to that level of saying, oh God, I'm not only hearing this and seeing this, I'm believing this for myself. And the only difference today for you that's going to really be the difference is that you get more than just a theory about it. And you get more than just an observation from outside about it. But you look up and say, I believe with all my heart that you went to that cross for me. I believe with all my heart that you shed your blood for me. Jesus said, if a man will believe, out of his belly will flow rivers of living waters. Oh, how many's glad today there's power. When you believe, there's power. When you call on the name of Jesus. The scriptures came together suddenly. John is now remembering that Jesus said in Matthew, from that time forth he began to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem. And suffer many things and uh, by the chief elders and priests and be killed and be raised again the third day. He remembers even Peter rebuking the Lord that day saying, no, no, that's not going to happen. And the Lord looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't have the mind of God. This is God's plan. Now John's thinking, he did say that. He did say that. Why didn't we think of that? Why? Why were, but they were so traumatized by the cross. They could not grasp the miracle of the tomb. He said in John 2 and 19, he answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He was, he was already talking. John 10 and 17, I lay down my life and I, that I might take it up again. There are all these scriptures today. I'm, I'm almost done. It says in verse 9, Right after all this, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again. See, this is what John was explaining. We were standing there, and the reason we didn't have faith was we, had, we didn't have scripture. But once we had scripture, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. And today, maybe you don't have faith because you've just been observing Christians. You can't get faith by watching people. Now, I know we should be good examples, and let me back up. Maybe you can get a little faith. But just as quick as you can get a little faith watching somebody, you can get a little doubt. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of the Lord. And John summed it up and said, we just didn't know the scripture. But now we do. Now we do. We've looked it up. We found it. It's verified. And that's why the Bible says as, they, as Jesus walked with two on that same day to the road to Emmaus that he expounded the scriptures. He didn't go, hey guys, it's me. Did a little Steve Martin there. <laughs> hey guys. Hey, look, look. He didn't even show them his wounds at that time. But he gave them the scriptures. Well, when you walk out of here with this book and you put your faith in God's word, out of your belly will flow rivers. Out of your life will come transformation. He said it was all there. And today, I'm just telling somebody right now, no matter where you are, maybe right now you have, you have come to a point in your life and you're looking into the abyss. You're looking to emptiness. You know what's interesting was that where they went... Where they went, he was not. And the angel said, he's not here. He is risen. And, and what's interesting to me is that folks will still be looking in all the wrong places. Not, not for necessarily the Lord, but just for fulfillment. What's going to make me happy? What's going to fulfill my life? And you know, that's kind of the American idea, even of Christianity, is you get Jesus and he just fulfills all your, all your hopes and dreams. But that's not what he said. He said, come take up my cross. You may not get in this life the fulfillment of what you think. Because that's a, an Americanized Christianity that says, oh, he will enhance. He will take you to the next level of your greatness. But instead, he says, take a cross. Be crucified with me. And if you will die with me, you will live with me. If you will suffer with me, you will reign with me. And right now, the life 
of the child of God. The world's looking into it and they're theorizing all these things. But you and I know today that we, once we realized that tomb was empty, we didn't have to stay there anymore. You don't have to live in emptiness. You don't have to live in the void. But you can, the Bible says they saw, I love this, and they went home. That's the last verse I read to you earlier. <clears throat> they saw it. He's risen. What do we do? I'm going to the house. Why stay here? He's not here. Oh, when you have God in your life, you have power. You don't have to live in the darkness. You don't have to live at the door of the tomb. But you get up and then you get to go to the upper room where the Lord gives you life everlasting. How many is thankful for the power of his name today? How many is thankful that he's alive and that he is risen from the dead? If you would, why don't we all stand right now and why don't we all give him praise together for he is alive forevermore. He is risen. He is alive forevermore. Oh, Jesus, we give you praise. Oh, Jesus, I'm thankful that, God, we have seen and we have believed. Oh, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? In the name of the Lord, I shut today. You're at the, you're at the same situation. Maybe you, you've done what John did. You've stopped. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're even reverential and thinking, I'd never make a good Christian. I've done too many bad things. Whatever it is that's keeping you from going the next step, I promise you it would be worth it to step into the will of God. Maybe today you've gone a little further, but now you're starting to get some theories about it. You've even gotten involved a little bit with the church, but you've seen some inconsistencies. You've seen flaws, and you've got theories now. You're thinking twice now about it. You see, got, your eyes are on the grave clothes, and you've got to see something beyond the grave clothes. You've got to see something beyond what was. And then John steps in, and he he sees the same thing and he remembers what Jesus had said and he believes. Are you just one step away from believing with all your heart? You see, here it is. This is what this is what it's all about because that tomb is empty. My heart is filled with joy and peace and hope today. Nobody's looking today. We're going to pray together. I'm going to ask if today this is not a prayer for you to raise your hand to be saved this is a prayer for all of us that know there's a next step that God is asking us there's a next deeper step in life in this room today wherever you are I, I'm going to let God talk to you I'm not going to be a salesman I'm not going to be a pitch man today I'm not going to try to do that I'm just going to let the spirit of God move on you today Maybe right now you know, you know what God's already been talking to you about. You cannot keep hanging around the emptiness. Take the look you need to take and move into what God has for you. Father, right now in the name of the Lord, I pray. In this room are so many different people, so many different backgrounds, religious experiences, faith experiences, fears, doubts disappointments, troubles it's all here it doesn't overwhelm you Lord you're, you're able in the least and in the greatest to save somebody in this room right now Lord I pray for them they've got to stop hanging out at the door they've got to go in and they've got to stop being the, the theorist the one that's God, they've got to give their mind to you. They've got to give their heart to you. They've got to believe this is by faith. This is by faith. By faith. I pray we believe in the name of the Lord. We're going we're gonna to welcome anybody to this altar today that wants
wants to walk up here and say, I I need prayer. I need prayer for my family. I need prayer for my children. I need prayer for a situation I'm going through. I I, want to be prayed for or prayed with. Would you right now, and I know it's a crowded building, but there will be saints of God that will be with you right now. It doesn't have to be everyone, but could we, Covenant Life members, make it easy on them and some of us move up and say, hey, look, why don't you come with me to the altar? Thank you for doing that right now. Thank you for making that move right now in the name of the Lord. It's just easy as taking steps. It's just easy as walking up here and where you stand today as well. There's a prayer for everyone today in this room. God, somebody in this house right now, they've never been filled with the precious gift of your Holy Spirit. Today is the day. Today is the day we believe. Today is the day that we trust you. Come and believe with us. Do as John. He saw and he believed today. I was lost. I was blind. He saw and he believed. I was running out of time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
I pray right now in this room, Lord, someone looking at empty places, God, it's, it's time to look beyond that. You want us to go home with a faith. You want us to go home and out of here, God, with power and life and strength and hope and resurrection in our lives. And I thank you, Jesus, for every believer. You said, he that believes and is baptized, they shall be saved. That's a promise. Lord, in this room, maybe someone's not been baptized. I pray for them, Lord, to go to the, to the waters of baptism. You said we are buried with you in baptism. We get to go to our own tomb with you of baptism. Our old self, our old ways, our past behind, washing away our sins. In the name of Jesus, God, never to be remembered anymore and to move forward in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, looking for that wonderful day when you're coming to get your people. I thank you, Lord. One more Easter, one more Resurrection Sunday. God, we're counting them down now. We're closer than we've ever been. God, I just don't know. This may be the last Resurrection Sunday, Easter. God, it's just getting closer and closer. You're coming back. You're coming back to get your church. And they that have believed and they that have received all that you have shall be saved. In Jesus' name I pray. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus for the washing away of your sins, I can't think of a better day than on Easter Sunday to make that commitment not, a, not about us but about you when Paul the great apostle was baptized the Bible says he called upon the name of the Lord washing away his sins and that's today what we'll do we've got water we've got clothing we will baptize you today right now we got every, we know it is a you must be born again of water and spirit you must be born of the water and of the spirit so that is ready and prepared for you if you would like to do that Either by raising your hand at this time or letting us know, we will baptize you in Jesus' name. We rejoice in that decision today. I'm telling you, it's a wonderful step. It's a wonderful next step of God's plan for your life. The promise of His Spirit is within this room. Covenant Life, thank you for being who you are and to all of our guests. Thank you for being here with Covenant Life. This is a special day for the children of God. And we celebrate with a lot of activities, commemorating our Lord and our Savior, what He has done in our lives. And here in the next few minutes, we're going to gather. Your children are waiting uh, for you as soon as we dismiss. If you have a child that is with our, uh, our children directors and all of that, please go to the exit and they will meet you there. And there is a candy rain. And there is an ice cream shop. It's all for the children. For the children. And, uh, and then if there's anything left, we might let a couple of you have some ice cream. Amen. Why don't you turn, shake hands one with another. Tell somebody it's good to see them on Easter Sunday. And we love you. And you have a wonderful day in the Lord. God bless you. I will make a point of clarification. There is ice cream for the adults as well. In fact, uh, if you would like to, uh, the adults can get in the line for ice cream while the kids are doing the candy rain. God bless you. We've got bags for the children. They are waiting on you. It's going to be a great day.